This is On The Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to On The Market. My name is Dave Meyer. I will be your host today. And we have a pretty cool special show for you today. If you listen to this show, you know we have a normal rotating cast of characters who come on and share their opinions. But we're bringing in an entirely new crew for this episode to talk about short-term rentals. You probably know this is one of the most popular, fastest growing investment asset classes in the entire industry. And with a lot of regulation, a recession, all this stuff going on right now, we wanted to bring in some experts to talk about this show. So we have a really good panel. We have Avery Carl on the show. She's writ- She wrote the book about short-term rentals for uh, Bigger Pockets. She's been on one of our shows earlier. We have Tony Robinson, who is the host of the Real Estate Rookie Show. And we have a newcomer for On the Market, Jenny Yee, who is an incredible investor and also has a really unique business in the short-term rental space. So you're going to want to check this one out. It's super helpful. Um, I learned a ton, and I think you will too. So stick around for this one. But first, we're going to take a quick break. Let me quickly just introduce our panel. First, we have Tony Robinson, who it's your first time and on the market. I can't believe it's been this long since you haven't been on yet, but host of the Real Estate Rookie Show. Tony, could you just briefly introduce yourself for people who might not know you yet? Yeah, absolutely, man. We're excited to be on, Dave. Like you said, Tony J. Robinson, co-host of the Real Estate Rookie Podcast. Uh, I am an investor based out of Southern California. My wife is also my business partner, and we've got, uh, I think, 30 properties now across a few different states. So it's been a been a busy couple of years for us. But um, dude, I'm excited to, to come here to talk shop, and we've got some other heavy hitters on the show here. So it's, it's going to be fun. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining. We also have Avery Carl, who you probably remember as the uh, undisputed winner of the last strategy showdown, <laughs> made it through all of Jamil and uh, David's dad jokes, and we uh, she did so well, uh, we, we invited her back. Avery, uh, can you just remind everyone who uh, who you are if, you, uh, if they haven't heard from you yet? Yeah, absolutely. And I always appreciate you having me on. Always happy to do it. Uh, so my name's Avery Carl. I'm a real estate investor first. I have 240 doors currently, no partners, just my husband. And uh, I am the CEO and founder of The Short Term Shop, which is uh, the, a real estate team that focuses on selling and buying short-term rentals or, or working with clients to sell and buy short-term rentals. Uh, I wrote the Bigger Pockets book on short-term rental investing called Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth. And uh, I think that's everything. Nice. Yes. Wrote the book on short term rentals. That's a good that's a good uh, claim to fame for the show. And then uh, our third guest today is an on the market newcomer, Jenny Yi. Welcome to the show. Uh, could you please introduce yourself to everyone? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm Jenny Yi. I'm a flipper turned long term investor turned short term investor. And now my team travels the country um, and soon to be internationally. And we specialize in product sourcing, designing, and setting up hospitality, so short-term and hotels, hotel conversions to short-term models, um, and helping the everyday investor figure out how to put their budget towards the best use. All right, great. Well, thank you all for being here. We're going to dive into uh, everything about short-term rentals. All right, Avery, I'd love to start with you being both an agent and an investor. Can you just give us an overview of what you're seeing in the short-term rental market right now? Yeah, yeah. So I only focus on one type of market. I focus uh, both in my own investing and with a short-term shop in the regional, drivable, mature vacation rental market. So it's kind of hard to give like a state of the market in terms of short-term rentals. Uh, It's more of like a state of each market. So there's different things going on in, in each market. Uh, I know in metro markets, it, it can be pretty tough as of late, um, just with regulations and the whole, you know, hurting the local economies thing. Uh, and vacation markets is a little bit different. Uh, what we're seeing is the people who bought right and in the right market are continuing to do well. And the people who bought stuff that was kind of on like maybe too far out in the outskirts or maybe kind of a weird property just because they really, really wanted to get something while interest rates are low. Those are the folks that are kind of struggling now because definitely inflation and the economy is a factor. But I think what's more of a factor is that 
Last year and the year before, you could have bought basically anything and never paid attention to it again and never decorated it and just rented it, you know, just basically like a crock pot, set it and forget it and done fine. But now that we're moving back into what I would call more of like a normal market, you do actually have to pay attention to your listing. You do have to make sure that the decor is what it needs to be and that you're getting in there and tweaking your pricing here and there to make sure that you're keeping up with things. So I think not only the economy, but people who bought things that and just kind of quit paying attention and thought that that was going to continue forever, the not having to pay attention thing. Uh, those are the ones that we're seeing kind of kind of struggle. Yeah. And I mean, I guess you could just say that not paying attention to any sort of investment is uh, bound True. to not do well. Yeah. 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 I have to pay attention long term. Uh, uh, what about on your the agent side of things? Are you still seeing demand for short term rentals? Are people, are investors still buying? Yes, they are. So what we're seeing now is because interest rates are high, there is a lot of opportunity in terms of getting discounts on deals, but you know that interest rate still does make that monthly payment quite a bit higher. So what we're seeing is most of our investors pivoting out of our more blue chip markets. And by blue chip, I mean the markets that are always going to be great places to own, like the Smokies, Destin, Florida, et cetera. These areas that get millions and millions of tourists a year, they're really established, always going to be great, but you're going to pay to get into those markets. They're more expensive. We're seeing people pivot out of those into cheaper markets that are also mature vacation markets like the Western North Carolina mountains or the Forgotten Coast in Florida rather than like the Panama City Beach Destin area. So people are still buying because there's a lot of opportunity in terms of being able to get deals because sellers are scared too. Nobody knows what's going to happen with the economy, if anything. So um, it's a really good time to capitalize on that but you do have to pay attention to those interest rates. So what people are doing are just pivoting from more expensive markets to get into to cheaper markets to get into. Tony, you, you're mostly in vacation hotspots, right? That's correct. Yeah. And how, how are you seeing uh, things play out in where you own your short-term rentals? Yeah, I think very similar to, to what Avery kind of hinted at already. So we have uh, a few cabins out in Tennessee. We actually use Avery Seam for, for all those. Um, and then we have uh, quite a few properties out in California near, near Joshua Tree. We're uh, branching out to Branson and some other states as well. And I, I think a lot of what Avery said is true, right, is, is we are starting to see um, some of these people that were, were dabbling in short-term rentals, they're probably the ones that are getting beat up the most. So when you look at you know all the different asset classes across real estate investing over the last couple of years, short-term rentals have kind of been like this gold rush, right? Where everyone was making a bunch of money. You know, all these other investors who had no desire really to be short-term rental operators saw other people making money, so they they kind of jumped in. And you're you're seeing this influx of demand. But here's what I think will happen. And I don't have a crystal ball, but here's what I think will happen. The, the people who weren't committed to being world-class as short-term rental operators, they're eventually going to exit the space. And I've already, I'm already seeing it happen. There are investors that I know, they're like, oh yeah, I bought, a, I bought an Airbnb. It was the worst experience ever. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and I, I think we'll continue to see that. And you'll eventually start to see things kind of level out um, across probably most, most big markets. Yeah, that makes sense. What, what about on the demand side? Are you still seeing... Um you know, strong demand for all of your properties is revenue still doing pretty good. Yeah. So I would say 2021 was probably uh, an anomaly in terms of revenue for a lot of markets, right? You had this uh, a tremendous amount of pent up demand from COVID. Um, and what we've seen in 2022 so far is that most of our properties are slightly lower than 2021. However, when you look at aggregate data, 2022 is still better than 2019. It's still better than 2018. So there was a spike in 2021. Things have kind of normalized in 2022. So I'd say all of our properties are still profitable, right? Like we're still making really good returns on our money. But like the the first cabin that I purchased, I spent $60,000 to purchase that property. It was fully furnished, five bedroom cabin in the Smoky Mountains. I profited $84,000 in that cabin last year. Um, I'm probably not going to hit that same number again this year, but it's still going to be a pretty, pretty solid return. I think that's super important context, not just with short-term rentals, but just everything in the housing market over the last couple of years is that the last two years have just been anomalous. Like it's not normal data. And so if you see occupancy, like we were preparing for the show, looking at occupancy, it is down over 2021. But it's still well above where it was in 2019 and 2020. So there, there's, it's important to to take these things in context and 
understand that as investors in 2021, all of us across strategies probably did better than normal. And some reversion back to regular performance is not just to be expected, it's probably better um, in the long run. Jenny, can you tell me a little bit about what you're seeing both with your own investments and your your clients that you're you're working with to set up their own short-term rentals? Absolutely. Honestly, I'm just I'm going to reiterate what's already been said that there's so much talk right now, especially in the social media and in the groups where a uh, host and owners are basically panicking and saying that there's a shift in the market. I don't believe that there's a shift in the market. I think there's a normalization of the market. So, if you take the whole concept of what Airbnb and short-term rental is supposed to be. It was this idea of taking the bed and breakfast, which has always been around since hotels have been around, because you're always going to be that population of people who just don't like to stay in hotels. So you take the concept of the bed and breakfast, you combine it with technology, and you get easy access. That was the whole purpose of creating these apps to for people to have easy access to this model. Investors jumped on it because of great interest rates because of COVID, because of a prime opportunity, but they thought that they could just purchase the property and literally set it and forget it. That's not the type of set it and forget it that we want. You know, you for a while when you had this mass influx of travel, yes, it worked. But now what you see in this quote unquote shift is you see basically competition, because that's what this is at the end of the day, is these are competitions between properties, just like it is, you know, capitalism. You see the best properties the best cultivated properties, the people who had taken to the business of hospitality, those are rising to the top. So the market itself and competition is normalizing, not necessarily in some chaos. So in order to succeed, you really have to, as an investor, assess whether or not this is the business model that you want to be in. So for every strategy, whether it's long-term, whether it's short-term, buy and hold, short-term is a strategy. And in order to be successful, you have to understand the business. You can still be passive, but you have to be willing to invest the models and the people who are also willing to work on your behalf in the business of hospitality in order to be successful. And that can be in high range markets, that can be in local markets. It's just all about who your population and who your guest experience is going to be. And if you can nail that down, those are the people that are rising to the top instead of your people that are just buying a house and listing it for the mere sake of listing it. So because of that, because, you know, the professionals are just as active or maybe more active, are you seeing that reflected in your business? Are you, you know, is, is business still pretty strong for people who want to, you know, put in these high end furnishings and create sort of this luxury experience? Well, and it's funny because, um, Our clients, I would say about half of our clients are actually still in the luxury market. They're putting in about five figures into our, the setups. Um, The other half of the clients are actually investing really local. So what they're doing is they're seeing, for example, we just finished a property out in the middle of Dangerous, Tennessee, which most people have never heard of Dangerous, Tennessee. It's literally an hour outside of Knoxville. You would never know. But this particular lake is the go-to lake for this bass pro fishing contest um, that happens every year. So it is the go-to for your local people to go and stay. So it there's this shift of, okay, if you don't have the ability and you don't have the money to buy luxury, if you don't have the thousands of dollars to dump into a property, you can still get into the game by looking local. You can still get into the game by seeing how the average person vacations because most people will actually never leave their state, believe it or not, when they're traveling elsewhere. So if we look at these numbers and we look at these trends that existed pre-COVID, that was the trend. People vacation in their own state. So half of my clients are only spending less than 10 grand to set up properties, but they're capitalizing on the local scene versus trying to overextend themselves in a market that they know that they're not willing to put their money into. Dave, can I make, I just want to add one comment on that. Like Jenny, I I love that point because I, I do think that, especially for new investors in this space, Everyone does want to go towards those blue chip markets, but what we've seen is that the the price increases in those markets over the last couple of years haven't been met with 
revenue increases, right? So, you know, our, our cabin, the first cabin we bought, it's almost doubled in value, but my revenue hasn't almost doubled in value over that same time, right? So I think there are definitely a lot of opportunities in some of these secondary and tertiary markets. So we went on like a world tour of the United States this summer. I submitted offers in Cloudcroft, New Mexico, um, Dundee, New York, um, different parts of Missouri, like Arkansas. Like we, we've been kind of like all over the place trying to identify what are some of these up and coming more secondary markets that maybe five years from now will have some of the same, uh, you know, amenities and attractions and things that we saw in some of these more, more popular blue chip markets like we talked about? All right, Tony, I have to ask you about Dundee, New York. I might be like one of three people in the world who have ever been there. Have you really been there? Yeah. No <laughs> Dude, so yeah, we, we, I went to college in Rochester, which is not far yeah. from there. And like, at, you know, after you graduate college, everyone's like waiting around to graduate and just getting drunk. And they like mm-hmm. arranged for us to like take these chartered bus to like, there's all these wineries. Wineries. Finger Lake stinks. <laughs> and everyone was just faced and like, I probably can't curse on the podcast, but just like puking out the windows. It's like the last day of college. So that's why I was in Dundee, New York. And it was just a nightmare. But, but there, yeah, like as, as someone who lives in California, I had never heard of Dundee, but we stumbled across the Finger Lakes and we, we start looking at properties over there. And like you said, there's, there's a massive amount of wineries and breweries and wedding venues. And there's just like this burgeoning scene of, of, attractions kind of drawing people in. So we said, man, if we can get a property here, as things start to develop, we could be in a really good spot. So I think for a lot of the new investors, trying to find those um, upcoming markets is, is where we should be focusing our time right now. Tony, how how did you identify some of these markets? You know, if you if um, you all are saying that, you know, some of these blue chip markets, they're overheated, like what are the things that attracted you to some of those markets you went and looked at? That's a that's a great question, Dave. So for us, it's it's part research and it's part networking. Um, I've fed, I found another investor. I met this guy who vacationed in the Finger Lakes. He was like, yeah, you know, he's from New York somewhere. He was like, yeah, every summer we go out to the Finger Lakes. I was like, what is the Finger Lakes? Right? Like I'd never even heard it before. After doing my research, I, I saw kind of what the, what the draw was. So part of it is just talking to other investors, seeing where, where they vacation, where they're thinking about investing, what's like the local hot spots near them. The other piece is a, a more kind of data driven approach where we're just like, okay, what are some of the big draws in each state, right? Like if I go to Arkansas, what are people doing in Arkansas? And then, okay, where are some of the markets where where the price to, to, to revenue ratio is, is really strong. So we use kind of both approaches, right? Where it's it's kind of subjective talking to people, then a little bit more objective where we're looking at data based on price points and revenue. I just wanted to hit on something that Tony said. So he met a friend who gave him or introduced him to this market because it's somewhere that he vacations. So I think that's really important. And anybody who you know listens to anything that I say gets tired of me saying the market is almost more important. The market that you choose is almost more important than the property you choose. And to avoid regulation issues, you always want to start with other than, I mean, you could Google, but you want to start with where have I vacationed or where is someone I know vacation on a regular basis where they stayed in a single family home rather than a hotel pre Airbnb. So before Airbnb. So like I grew up living in Mississippi. We went to Destin, Florida every single year. My grandmother went to Destin, Florida every single year since 1937. So you start there to kind of figure out, okay, this is an area where short-term rentals are not a new thing. They've been around for a while. So it's probably, again, you, there are exceptions to every rule and you're going to have to do your research, but it's probably going to be more friendly than like a, oh yeah, I'm going to, I live in Nashville and this house down the street from me is cute. I'm going to buy that and short-term rent it. That, that's a really good point. I love that way of finding it. I actually, I only own one short-term rental. I'm just a baby, but I did it because there's this place I love skiing and I would go up there and there's just no hotels. Like there was nowhere you could stay and you'd have to just take day trips. And I was like, did it selfishly so that I could go ski. But I was like, people are, there's going to be huge demand for this because there's, there's not anywhere you can stay and they have refrained from regulating. I don't, that's just one data point, but that, that brings up a great point, Avery, that I wanted to talk about, which is regulation, because a lot of major metros right now are starting to regulate SDRs or outright ban them. I think Dallas um, just put in something pretty strict. Atlanta was doing it. it. It's sort of all over the country. But there has been this sort of like prevailing thought process that these markets that are more vacation centric 
need need that need the short term rentals economically. But at the same time, we're seeing sort of these like housing affordability problems in these markets. And so you do see a lot of local, I wouldn't say backlash, but concern about the the role that short term rentals are playing in housing affordability and availability um, in some of these housing markets. So I'm curious how you're seeing if you're seeing that uh, play out in some of the markets where you operate. Yeah. So again, it goes back to you really have to choose your market well. So it, like in Destin, where I live, their short-term rentals have been so woven into the local economy for so long that we couldn't live without them. There are not really any hotels. And there, if short-term rentals, say something came along and short-term, there were, you couldn't short-term rent anything in Destin anymore. There aren't enough locals to fill all of what those would be open long-term rentals so it wouldn't, it's not a, a situation where it's taking housing away from people who would be living here locally, uh, cause there's just so many. And then, and it's always been that way. And then also the way the regulations work. So there's a highway that runs through the entire Emerald coast called highway 98 for all the way from Destin to Panama city. It goes further than that, but we're stopping at the Emerald coast. So in Destin, one of the main cities there. You're only allowed to short-term rent south of Highway 98, not north of Highway 98. So south is where you would want to be as a short-term rental owner anyway, because south is walkable to the beach. That's where the tourists are going. North is more, I mean, you've got every level of housing from, you know, really affordable to like $10 million houses up north. So there's plenty of different types of housing for whatever you might want to have, but there is that limit as to where the short-term rentals can be. So it can never just be all short-term rentals and nobody can live here. So regulations are important. I don't want to, for people to take away from this conversation that regulations are bad. Regulations are really good. You need to have regulations. So where I live in Walton County, just East of Destin, the 30A area, there are no regulations, but it operates very similar to Destin. And there's actually like a bunch of stuff with the city council right now where they want to add some regulations to Walton County, which I vote yes on every time because right now it's kind of the Wild West and nobody knows like who to call if there's a problem or if something's on fire. Like they need to know who it's registered to, who they're calling if there's a problem. So it's good to have regulations, but not there's a fine line. You don't want to go over the top to where you're buying in a market that they don't want you there. That's where you kind of have to deal with a lot of fighting back. But as long as you're buying in markets where you're not necessarily taking housing away from locals, because there just wouldn't be enough locals to fill all of that housing, then you know, you're going to be in good shape. Yeah, Avery, you, you make so many good points, and I, I just want to piggyback off of that. There, there's really two things that I, I think of when it comes to regulations. The, the first thing, and this is, I, I think, a really important fact for new investors to, to understand, is that demand and regulations are in no way correlated with one another. Right. So like if you think about a, a super popular market like Destin, right, if the local government said short term rentals are no longer allowed in Destin, does that mean that as soon as that policy passes that all the people who have been vacationing in Destin every year for their entire lives no longer want to go to Destin? It doesn't. Right. So if we understand that the demand and policies are not necessarily connected to one another, just because a market is highly regulated doesn't mean that it's a bad place for you to invest in. As long as you can understand what those regulations are, abide by them, then you actually might benefit from that increased regulation because it means supply might stay low. And if supply stays low while demand goes high, basic of economics, it means we can charge more as hosts in those cities. So as an example, um, we invest near Joshua Tree National Park, and there are three cities that surround that national park. One of them is 29 Palms. And 29 Palms recently revamped their regulations to where they put a hard cap on the number of permits that they'll issue. Now, most people look at that and say, man, that's a terrible thing. But what happens if you're one of the people that is uh, admitted under that cap? And we have three properties in 29 Palms that now doesn't matter how popular that market gets, demand is going to be held at a certain level. So it's great for us because we, we play by the rules we got and it's working for us. So that's the, the first thing. And the second piece you, you touched on this too, Avery, was the economic dependency. We really do try and focus on markets that uh, are primarily driven by vacation and tourism. I live close to Los Angeles. You know, you mentioned Atlanta, Dave. 
LA and Atlanta, some of the biggest markets in the country, right? They have every single type of industry business you can think of. There's film, there's television, there's radio, there's business headquarters, universities, port, like every kind of like economic driver exists within those two cities. So what like incentive do they have to protect short-term rentals? So every market that we go into, we want to make sure that there is a strong economic dependency on short-term rentals because it it doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be regulations, but it means that those regulations will still allow you to operate profitably in those markets. Yeah. In some ways, I mean, I totally get the idea of trying to make more affordable housing. It's just not affordable for many people. And that's just a nationwide problem. That is not not necessarily a, a short-term rental problem. Um, and I get the the instinct to blame short-term rentals, but just for people knowing, like the total supply of short-term rentals in the United States makes up about 1% of the housing stock in the entire country. So there are places where it's more concentrated, you know, like, so, so there are communities where it is more impactful, but even if you turned in my, this is just my opinion, if you turned every short-term rental into a long-term rental it probably wouldn't have that big of an impact on prices in that neighborhood. There, there are more structural fundamental problems, mainly really, you know, unaffordable housing, a, sh- a supply shortage that goes across the entire country that are sort of contributing to that. But I do think um, there is going to continue sort of be this instinct by governments who are probably just trying to do right by their constituents to like regulate, even though it might not necessarily work. Well, And that's also a good point, too, because we have to understand that a lot of these regulations that are coming out are in response to the the boom that we just had in all these purchases. So it doesn't mean that they're here to stay. They are experimenting with the balance just as much as investors are experimenting with the balance. So it's going to be ever changing. So just because there's a regulation in the market, just like Avery and Tony said, doesn't necessarily mean that you don't invest there. It just it it acts as a filter, quite honestly, for you to determine as an investor how much you're willing to be in this game. Are you willing to be in the hospitality game? So this this regulation is now acting as a filter in which you are willing to play by the rules, which you are willing to put up the capital time wise, not just monetarily, to put the right systems in place so that you can be part of a successful area that's regulated. Or do you want to play in a market that's completely different? Both of them are very different strategies. Both of them have their plus and minuses. But just because there's regulation doesn't mean that there's going to be regulation a year from now. It's ever changing. And that's something that we have to monitor as investors and both as people helping our clients. Okay, that's a great question, Jenny. And it's something I want to bring up because a lot of times when I hear these conversations about short term rentals, someone's like, well, They've only regulated, I I live in, I I used to live in and invest in Denver and they put in uh, a a regulation that you can only short-term rental your primary residence. So like if you have an ADU or like for me, I moved out of the country, still have a primary residence, I could short-term rental that. Um, uh, But no one else can. So people are like, oh, I just want, like, I'm going to buy everything that's just outside Denver because that's going to be the perfect spot. But I'm always like, but that city could just add a regulation like a, a couple of weeks from now. Or they're like, oh, you can only do it more than seven days. So we're only letting people for eight days. So now my my strategy is fail proof. I'm like, yeah, but the city council could just change it to nine days. You know, like they could always keep uh, changing it. So, Jenny, how do you how do you plan a business when you're sort of constantly in this chain, uh, this risk of changing bit, uh, environment and regulations? Absolutely. And it's a fair question. And it goes back to how much skin do you want in the game? So when my clients come to me, most of the clients that I have have already purchased a property, but I do have some clients who are like, I don't know where to purchase a property. I don't know where to begin. And a question that I often get is the regulations piece. So for example, I'm normally based out of Austin whenever I'm home. Uh, Austin is a regulated city when it comes to SDRs. So, and, and it's known. Um, but that hasn't necessarily affected demand. People who do STRs here are really successful because the mere fact that Austin is also a hub for everything. The the number of music festivals here, the number of business professionals that come here, the number of extras, it's the assessment of your return based on the market that's coming in and how much you want to put into that. So the clients who choose and who have been very successful in Austin are willing to take that trade off because they know there's so many reasons to invest in Austin. Now, there are other 
clients who are like, I really just, I don't want to deal with regulations. I don't want to have to predict changes. I don't want to have to make changes or even up my licenses or take care of the legal end and make sure that I'm checking the boxes. That's just not something that they want to be invested in. So then we start to look at different markets. We start to look at outside colleges. We start to look at outside military bases where we know there's going to be a high influx and transition of populations, things that we know that we can um, basically guarantee turnovers and that, uh, that are stable and always there with less concerns about actual regulation. And, and, and it, again, it goes back to your passive participation versus how much you really want to be invested in the hospitality aspect of the market. Dave, can I just share one one anecdote? So I, I mentioned we were in Dundee, New York over the summer, and uh, Ithaca, New York is a place that's not too far from Dundee. And we we're just tr- trying to do research around other cities around the Finger Lakes. And Ithaca instituted new short-term rental ordinances over the summer. Before, you could rent your property out all 365 days out of the year. After this ordinance passed, and I just looked it up, the, the new limitation was that you could only rent your property for 29 nights out of the year if you were non-lakefront, and you got 245 if you were actually on the lake. So could you imagine the people who purchased in Ithaca that were renting their properties out 365 days out of the year to now only be able to do that for one month? right? 29 nights out of the entire year. So that's why like my, my focus on there being that economic driver, that economic impact of short-term rentals is so important because even if it was a wild, wild west before, once that regulation comes down, it's hard to know where it's going to land. Man, the people on the city council must own all those lakefront properties. (laughs) Yeah. We're just going to take this for ourselves. (laughs) All right. So I want to switch gears a little bit uh, because there's Obviously, a lot of fear about recession and economic downturn right now. And just over the last couple of weeks, we've gotten a lot of conflicting, weird economic data. GDP grew in Q3. Job market was strong. But just in the last couple of the last week, really, we're starting to see a lot of layoffs in the job market. Uh, Big companies like Meta and Stripe and Twitter are all laying off people and You know, there is fear, uh, I think rightfully, that we're entering, uh, you know, we don't know if we're in a recession right now, maybe, maybe not, whatever. Um, That will be for the the economists to decide. Uh, But we might be entering sort of this job loss phase where unemployment might start to come up. And I think there is some fear, and I sort of believe this, that demand could start to falter and people might be taking less vacation. And I was Googling around to try and understand this, and I actually found research you did, Tony, um, about this, about how, like, (laughs) I was like, oh, perfect. I could ask him about it on the show. Um, So I was curious, could you just tell uh, everyone who's listening about the research you did about, like, vacation spending during a recession? Yeah, you're you're putting me on the spot here, man. I wish I had those numbers memorized like off the top of my head, but <laughs> here's here here here's what I remember, right? Um I, I did a bunch of research and we we post this on our YouTube channel because I was having these same questions as the the economy was starting to shift, right? And I looked back at at every recession going back to like the the mid nineteen hundreds. And it was like six months, sixteen months, nine months, eight months, and obviously two thousand eight was the big one, it was like a year and a half. But every single recession lasted, excluding 2008, between six and like 14 months, somewhere around there, right? And what I saw was that even during these recessions, vacation spending didn't go to zero. People were still spending money going on vacations. The amount amount of money they were spending obviously decreased, and and the number of people who were taking vacations decreased. But we didn't like, it wasn't like Hilton and Marriott's occupancy just went to zero because of a recession. (laughs) And when I saw that data, it was comforting for me for a few reasons. One, it let me know that even even if we hit like some really turbulent times in the middle of a recession, we will still have people come into places like Joshua Tree and the Smoky Mountains, right? Like these are these are places that people will probably continue to travel to. Second, can my property sustain a six to 14, 16 month slowdown? And then recover afterwards. And my thought was like, yeah, like our properties have enough wiggle room between what we typically generate in revenue and what those expenses are. So even if we just break even for 12 months, I can live with that because I know on the on the other side, the economy always continues to grow on the other side of a recession. So when I looked at all these different factors, Dave, it was it was re reassuring to me to say, I'm investing for the long term and I can weather a, a six month to, to 12 month to 14 month storm in my business. 
Well, I'll bail you out because I read this today. So uh, yeah. you said that you said that the worst one was about a nine percent decrease in vacation spending. So like, yeah, it could be like, but most businesses like you should be able to weather like a five to eight percent drop in revenue if you buy correctly and ha- have a solid investment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Avery, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I do. Uh, again, Tony and I. <laughs> have a lot of the same philosophies on investing in short-term rentals. So I'm going (laughs) to use the word piggyback again. Um, But to piggyback off what Tony said, so I think in times of recession, that's kind of when those blue chip markets that we talked about earlier kind of come back into play. So I took a quick look at my price labs and all of my, I have eight short-term rentals, all of them except for one are in what I would call blue chip markets. And my revenue this year is actually up 5% from last year. So it's not like, you know, a banner year or anything, but, you know, a little fluctuation. Uh, But I think that you can have a lot of success in right now, if you're choosing to buy right now, in maybe looking for value add opportunities in the blue chip markets. So you're not paying those turnkey prices necessarily, but finding some forced appreciation because in... downturns, those blue chip markets, you know, they're blue chip for a reason. They've been through every economic cycle. They've been through multiple natural disasters, like they've seen it all. And there are still millions and millions of people coming every year. So that's again, I'm going to say it again, why (laughs) choosing the market is really important buying in the right market. Well, to play off that, I think there's uh, also the concept of what we think of blue chip, because again, this goes back to earlier in our conversation about the buy-in price point for those blue chip markets that everybody also needs to understand, and this does tend to come out in a recession, is that every state has their own version of a blue chip market. So, and that caters to the people that never leave the state and that caters to the people that are most likely to be affected by a recession because they can't actually afford to leave outside the state. So even though we talk about places like Joshua Tree, and we talk about places like Gatlinburg, you know, again, those have survived millennia and they will continue to survive millennia but if your price point isn't there this is the perfect time to start looking and finding your blue chip market in your state where your locality is going to continue to go even in a recession that's that's such a good point yeah i think yeah as tony showed like the total amount of spending goes down but it might just be shifting to a different kind of spending If you look at inflation data, for example, one of the things that has been driving inflation the most is airline costs. Super expensive to fly right now. It's like gone up like 20 or 30 percent year over year. So that, you know, you can really imagine a scenario where people might just instead of flying to another state or internationally just decide to drive to that local blue chip market that you're talking about, Jenny. I'm curious, you know, as you know, I I, I tend to agree, like people still do spend money, but there is, I think, risk in the market and certain markets might see a decline in occupancy or revenue because we're also seeing an increase in supply still, right? There, There are more Airbnb listings coming online that is slowing down a little bit, but I think there is a risk over the next couple of years. So Jenny, I'm curious, do you have any advice for anyone listening to who is currently operating a short term rental? Like if they start to see revenue decline, maybe a few less bookings, like what are some tricks that they could think about or or strategies that they can use to survive a potential downturn? Absolutely. I think the the reality is that this day and age, so if we talk about what COVID did to the market aspect of STRs, we need to also talk about what it did to our societal aspect in general. So people during COVID, we were inundated with HGTV. Most people just sat there and literally they could probably watch every single show that was on HGTV or a and and people that were invested in it. So we have this perception of what is pretty, what is attractive, and that's the baseline now. So if you're going into the short term market and you think the mere fact of just putting a property out just for the sake of putting a property out is going to get you your nightly rate, it's not. And now we're even at the point where the expectation is your HGTV staged home. So that no longer in itself is even good enough to be the competition. So instead, what I tell my clients is that assume that Airbnb, assume that VRBO, assume that all these apps are basically a gigantic magazine rack. What's going to catch their eye is the most attractive one. They're going to look at it and then people want experiences nowadays. They don't just want to go to some pretty house. 
They don't just want to go to some place. They're looking for a new way of being, a new way of interacting with people, a new way of interacting with locals, a new way of experiencing wherever it is that they're going. So from the get-go, curated design, not just pretty, but design that is meant to make a person feel like they've escaped wherever they've gone is going to get your nightly rate up. And then from there, you don't have to dump in millions of dollars or thousands of dollars or even just tons of money um, to be in this game. You just have to spend your money well. So people are spending their money to create these staged homes that, again, are beautiful, but they're not booking the same way that someone who has spent less that has spent the money on hosting, who has spent the money on the experience, who has sourced local artists, who has curated um, localities and examples and suggestions of where to go and what to be. And if your if your bottom line is if your place is, looks like a dorm room, but you spent the money to like put a wall mural on it, people aren't going to book your place just because it's a wall mural. They're wanting the entire experience of everything. So it's all about the whole thing. And it's all about looking at it from a hospitality standpoint, not just a mere investment standpoint. That's so true. I'm going with my partner, Jane, to stay at an Airbnb uh, starting tomorrow. And our host sent us this like beautiful welcome kit. And like, I, I personally just don't even read this stuff, but Jane's like eyes like lit up. She's like, Oh my God, they're so <laughs> thoughtful. They love us. Like it's, you know, it's like one yeah. of those things. It really is a whole experience. And you do really like, you do feel like you're going to be cared for. Like I know going into that now that it's going to be a positive experience. I haven't even stepped foot in it yet. Um, so totally agree. Um, Tony or Avery, do you, either of you have some advice on, on, uh, how to, how to mitigate or navigate a, a potential downturn that might come next year? Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to state the obvious here, but cash reserves are as important as they have ever been. And what's the saying about when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. Um, it's you really have to make sure. I, I think a lot of people over the past few years uh, kind of jumped into short term rentals because it was like the new sexy thing to do. And apartment buildings are boring and uh, and they have over leveraged themselves, uh, you know, he locking one thing to finance another thing without any space or any margin in between so that if one property goes under, then all the properties are going under. So I think just, you know, your good old classic managing your money well and having enough cash reserves to weather any potential storm, because it's unlikely that something's going to come along. If anything was going to do it, it was going to be COVID, but something's going to come along and make you make no, have no bookings for months at a time. You should be able to have enough to break even, but if not, those cash reserves should be in place to get you through and to the end of that recession. Yeah, I think um, yeah, all fantastic points, right? I think design, cash reserves, those are incredibly important things we should all be focusing on. But like when I when I think about the things that that kind of might help someone weather this storm that, that may or may not be coming, it's it's three things really: it's location, amenities, and price. Location is something that you can't really fix <laughs> once you've purchased the property. <laughs> um, but I, I think that every market probably has a, a spot where if you're in that zone, you're going to do well, like almost no matter what. Like the, the first property that we purchased, it's it's literally like a, a two minute drive from the main drag in the Smoky Mountains. And that like people rave about that location. It's a cool cabin, but I've seen cooler cabins that don't do as well as ours. But for us, it's, it's that location. So I think location is one of the, the most important things you should be focusing on, especially if you're sourcing new properties. The second thing, and this this kind of touches what, what Jenny was speaking about, is, is the amenity standpoint. Every market has almost a baseline of what guests expect when they when they book in that market. So for example, if you're in the Smoky Mountains, you need to have a hot tub, right? Like every big cabin has a hot tub. Additionally, most big cabins have either a game room or, or a movie theater room. And if you don't have, the, like that's just like the barrier to entry in that market. So if you really want to stand out, you have to find a way to go above and beyond. Now, in some other markets, like for example, in Joshua Tree, when we first started investing there, almost no one had a hot tub. And since we came from the Smoky Mountains, we're like, why is no one else doing this? Hey, you get dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's too damn hot. But now, but now almost every listing, a lot of these listings now have the water features, right? So it's like you want to start identifying what are 
are some of the amenities that will allow you to be competitive in your market? And sometimes maybe instead of going out and buying another property, maybe you reinvest those funds into your existing properties to increase your ADR, to increase your amenities and to increase your return. And then the last thing you can do is obviously focus on price. In our portfolio, we try and we try and compete on price last, right? Because th- I, I think that's a slippery slope for for all of us, right? If I start undercutting people in my market, they start undercutting me. Now we're all charging less, and uh, at the end of the day, none of us are winning. So we want to try and compete on price last. But I do think there is a way to, um, I don't know, to, to 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 use price in a way that's that's still kind of smart. Right. If you have uh, an opening over the next seven days, maybe get a little bit more aggressive with that price. Right. If you're seeing that the the, the booking lead time for your other properties are at like 21 days and you're at 40, or I'm sorry, you're at like 12, it means that you're you're overpricing. So there are some data points you can look at to try and adjust your price and to be a little bit more competitive. But overall, location, amenities, and price are the three things you really look at. Brilliant. All right. Yeah. I, that is that is excellent advice. I. Uh... I, I totally agree about the amenities thing. It's just like you have to think if you don't have those key things like a hot tub like you mentioned or a movie theater, like people click those filters on Airbnb, you know, and yours just don't even wind up showing up in the, in the results. So you have to you have to be competitive. I think generally just in real estate, you have to think of your properties as a product and you have to compete against the people who are offering better products than you. And you need to make sure that you're positioning yourself accordingly. All right. The last thing I want to talk about before we get out of here today is I have a theory uh, and I'd like to tell it to you and you can tell me if I'm an idiot or if you agree. (laughs) Pull no punches. Um, No. So my my theory, I've talked about this on the show and it's not really that radical, is that the vacation rentals hotspots, some of the stuff that we've been talking about over the last couple, over the course of the show, are going to see the largest decline in property prices over the next year or two uh, in this housing market correction. Um, My theory is not necessarily even driven entirely by short-term rentals, but we saw this huge spike in second home demand during the pandemic where wealthy people were just buying these second homes. And it's often in a market that overlaps, right, with with short-term rentals. We've now seen that demand not just come back to normal, but is below pre-pandemic levels. At the same time, there are some of these, uh, you know, headwinds for just investors in general. So I think like uh, demand is falling off across all asset classes. So I I don't necessarily think this will impact existing short-term rentals. I actually think it means that there might be really good opportunity. And I'm always skeptical to time the market, but this is one where I'm like really kind of tempted to time the market. I kind of think that prices in these really very expensive, really great vacation rental properties might come down 10 or 20% over the next couple of years. So I'm just curious what you all think of this theory. I'm ready to buy them if and when they do. I don't know <laughs> what <laughs> I don't know what to think about if they will actually. Um, I think they'll come down some. I don't know if they'll come down 20%, but um, it's hard to say because at the end of the day, short-term rentals are still what I would call kind of an emerging asset class. Uh, I don't think that they're finished growing yet. The, t- the vacation industry as a whole is continuing to grow. And um, I don't know if I agree that it'll come down that much. I think there is, there's no question things are going to come down some. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for when they do. I'll buy some more. <laughs> yeah, me too. Maybe this is just wishful thinking <laughs> on my part. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Dave, I, I think you bring up a good point, right? But here, here's... And I'm going to try and be like as as articulate with this idea as uh, as I can, right? <laughs> you could tell me it's stupid straight up. <laughs> no, no. Stupid. I mean, I, here here's here's there, there's one thing that I think is like the the linchpin, um, and and if this kind of continues to develop, I, I I don't think you'll be right. And I think it's it's the loan products surrounding the short term rental space. So if you think about every other asset class, uh, excluding single family long term rentals they all trade or they all sell based off of their NOI, right? If you look at an apartment complex, if you look at self-storage, mobile home parks, like all of these other big uh, non kind of single family type properties, they all trade based off their NOI. And typically when you go get debt for those kinds of properties, they're basing it off of their NOI, right? So the ability to get approved for a loan on something like a a self-storage facility or a small uh, apartment complex is based on how much revenue that property generates. 
in the short-term rental space, we don't quite have those uh, those same kind of abundance of loan products, right? I think we're now starting to see more of the DSCR-based options where they're, they are looking at the, the revenue that the property generates. But I, I think the bigger constraint to pricing in these markets right now isn't necessarily that people aren't willing to pay those prices. It's that they can't get approved for the debt to buy those things. And we saw, especially last year, where a lot of properties were going way over asking. People were paying all kinds of crazy money to, to bridge that gap between the appraised value and the purchase price. And I think we're, we're starting to run out of those people that have those deep pockets to do that. But if we continue to see the the evolving of the loan products for short-term rentals, where it's based on what those properties can generate, then I, I think you're going to be wrong. But you know, you're you're the you're the numbers guy. I'm just a podcast host that talks about <laughs> short-term rentals. No, no, you know way more about this than I do. Honestly, it's not a super data-driven. Uh, it's it's a lot of speculation on my part, and it's pure theory. Jenny, what do you think? I think just in general, we're going to see, and we have been seeing a shift back to, the, again, the normalization of the market. So in that aspect, do I think that that is not going to affect the vacation rental markets? Absolutely not, because at the end of the day, these are also properties. So it, they will be affected. Do I think it's going to be this drastic decrease? Not necessarily. And I do think that Tony brings up a good point in the fact that if a particular market, especially these blue chip markets that we're talking about, where you know, 80, 90% of the properties that are in a specific area are only used for short-term rentals or only used for vacation properties, and that's the only amount of loans that are going into it, then of course they're in an isolated bubble that I don't think is affected by the general market. But if you start to talk about the markets that are, that are a mix, a good mix of both short-term rentals, vacations, and your regular properties, then by default, they're, they're going to see the decrease just because the market, again, is normalizing itself. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate your feedback. We'll see. We'll have to do this again a year from now. We'll see what happened. I'll probably be wrong. Yeah. So I think that Tony makes a really, really good point about the loans because right now, short-term rentals sit in this kind of weird middle ground of are they residential or are they commercial? So they get appraised like a residential house. So your short-term rental that makes $100,000 a year for appraisal purposes with a bank is worth the same amount as the house next door that makes $0 a year that's not a rental. So you know what's a commercial short-term rental? It's a hotel. Well, there's lots of commercial banks out there doing financing for hotels. It's just that one of them has to kind of figure out how to step into the single family game and treat a sh single family short term rental as a hotel. And then I think I think that will actually drive prices up in a lot of markets because a lot of places, you know, the, the markets where the income is higher will drive that up. But somebody's going to have to figure out how to do that before it could get there. All right. Great. Well, thank you all so much. This has been super, super helpful. We do have to wrap this up, though. Where can people find all of you? Avery, if they want to connect with you, where should people do that? You can do that uh, on our website, www.theshorttermshop.com or on Instagram at the short term shop. All right. Tony, I know we have a friendly rivalry about our podcast, but I will give you some space to talk about your own podcast. <laughs> all right. I, but you know, I will admit that we are officially the number two podcast behind you guys. So no, 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 no way. <laughs> uh, so you guys can find me um, on the other bigger pockets podcast, real estate rookie. We drop episodes every uh, Wednesday and Saturday. Uh, my wife and I have a YouTube channel called the real estate Robinsons. We talk all things short term rental. So if you guys want to check us out there, it's the real estate Robinsons uh, Instagram, Tony J Robinson. And if you guys want to learn more about our investment company, it's alpha geek capital.com. Awesome. What about you, Jenny? You can find us on social media, Jenny, E J E N N Y Y I. Um, look for our tip Tuesdays with bigger pockets on Instagram, where we give all our recommendations for how to set up your STRs. Um, and then Instagram is Jenny e designs and websites, Jenny e designs.com. All right, great. And I am at the data deli on Instagram. If you have any questions for me, Thank you all so much for joining. This was a lot of fun. We'll have to do this regularly since short-term rentals are so popular. And uh, despite my my doomsday predictions are probably going to be, uh, now they're going to be growing 20% next year. So we'll have to uh, keep, you all, keep you all updated. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please make sure to give us a great review on either Apple or Spotify and subscribe on YouTube. We'll see you next time for On The Market. On The Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Research by Pooja Jindal. And a big thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team.
The content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies.